on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman presented by River Wind Casino. OU football stuff. We talk a little NIL. What's going on at OU with all of that? Then in football guys talking basketball, we talk OU basketball and the Oklahoma City Thunder. And we finish up talking a lot of NFL playoffs and winners and losers of the weekend. Please download and subscribe to the podcast. Rate it five stars and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right, our man Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Sunday, January 21st, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts and to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of january all you got to do is visit riverwind.com riverwind casino simply the best now recording this on sunday afternoon please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment ted we're gonna knock out the ou stuff and the fgtb stuff then we're gonna watch some nfl playoff football and come back for winners and losers i love our plan what could go wrong I love it. I, I'm excited. I think both games today have a chance to be fantastic. So we'll uh, we'll talk NFL playoffs, including what happens with Baker and the Bucks and winners and losers. But some exciting news. I think we officially have a TikTok. I, I'm oh. told that this is yeah, yeah. At OK underscore breakdown. Hello, fellow kids. <laughs> What's going on? So if that's your social media drug of choice, follow us on TikTok. We'll be putting some clips on there. Should have some fun with that. But yeah, really don't know what we're doing on there quite yet, but we're going to figure it out as we go. Yeah, well, I mean, I, that's something I'm going to have to uh, probably view from afar. Someone responded. We we put a couple videos on there already, and someone responded with, "Oh my God, TikTok Ted," <laughs> which is pretty good. Yeah, I I don't know. Probably going to hold off on a, a TikTok account for the time being. We'll see though. You we'll never see. know. We'll we'll see how the following grows. Maybe maybe it becomes a big deal. You never know. All right, let's jump in to the OU football stuff. And Ted, I'm going to need your help because. I don't do local radio anymore, but I've been told that there is a lot of talk going on right now about OU and its NIL operation. And there's a lot of chatter among the fan base about it. And it seems like the, the discourse on Twitter is pretty intense about this whole thing. So help me out, fill me in w what's going on. What it, what is the, What's the issue here? Well, so you've always had a group of fans that you've had a portion of fans that like, like the operation, the NIL, Venable's approach. Um, then you have a group of fans that, you know, want to be a little bit more aggressive than than we are. And then you've got a group of fans that are saying, if we don't go all in, we are, we're missing the boat. We're going to be left behind. And it's kind of always been the case and in, in the transfer portal, whenever the window first opened up, you know, you heard a little bit of chatter from, from each of those re represented groups. And it was just kind of business as usual. And then when Saban stepped down and you had this large amount of Alabama players, highly recruited kids, really good athletes enter the portal. I think it just, it lit the fuse and it, it felt like, well, Alabama's players are, are being, you know, distributed amongst other sec schools and we're missing, we're missing out on it. 
and it's because of NIL. And I think watching those players go elsewhere, um, you know, Texas and, you know, all, all, of, all across the board, I think people started to panic. And I get it. I mean, I understand. I understand the, the, the panic, the frustration. I get all of it. So I saw, I saw some of this on Twitter. And so I started reaching out to people. And basically my, my goal was to find out, okay, where exactly is OU at with their NIL stuff? And that led me to some interesting findings. OU's in, a, administration is, is working on this. Now, let me make something clear. The leadership at OU, they are never going to be a group that is going to blatantly and openly break the rules. It's just not going to happen. That's not how they roll. However, and I'm not going to divulge, 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 divulge. I don't know the details exactly because they told me not to, but they're getting very creative with some of these things. They recognize how important NIL is right now in college football. And they know how important it is for us to go into the SEC and in year one to have a good season. And, and they know that NIL money is, is one of the keys to roster building now, just is, right? That's the reality of college football. And I think this is the best way I can put it. OU's administration, they are doing some things that I never thought they, they would do. I'll just be straight up. Now, they are not breaking any rules. I want to make that clear. But they are walking right up to the line. And once again, I'll keep it vague. But they are redirecting money from the athletic department to the collective. Because they realize how important it is to have to have NIL money to bolster the roster and retain guys on your roster. So I get this feeling that there is this group of OU fans that think that OU isn't serious about NIL. They're not doing a good job. I'm here to tell you that's just not true. The administration absolutely recognizes the need to pile up NIL money. Until the system we've got changes. So I, I don't want to hear that OU isn't trying. Because they are, man. They are. And I, I just think that it's really hard to get to the level of, you know, some people are saying Tennessee's got $20 million to dish out. I, I don't think OU would ever be able to get there. Like the $18 million number that keeps getting floated around for Ole Miss what they're spending on NIL this season. I, I don't know if OU is ever going to be able to get there, but they're trying, man. I mean, they're, they're really trying. They're doing some creative stuff because they recognize how important it is. I, I don't know if that makes any of, of the fans that are mad about how things are going feel better, but I'm just here to tell you they are, they're putting a ton of effort into this. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's, um, I, I, there's a lot of money being thrown around and maybe it's, maybe it's easier to, to gather up a, a, a bunch of money and, and momentum whenever you haven't been good for a really long time. And all of a sudden I, there's an avenue to be good. It's really, it's a shortcut, right? It, it, it's a shortcut to recruiting and my, usually you have to win games, develop talent, get lucky. Like there's, there's a lot of things that go on there in order to climb the ladder. But now all of a sudden it's like, Hey, we can climb the ladder. We can, we can skip the line if we can raise a bunch of money. And there's some schools doing that. I mean, you know, Tennessee had a little bit of success and I think it ignited that fan base. So it's not, not shocking to see that they've raised a bunch of money. Kind of the same thing with Ole Miss. Um, 
you know, the question is, like Tennessee has a has a really big fan base that's really invested. So I could see some staying power there. Ole Miss, we'll see you better win. Like the amount of money that they're pouring in from not a not a huge fan base, like it better it better amount to some results. But for Oklahoma, you know, it's interesting. It's we are in a really weird spot. It's almost like a purgatory to some degree to where We've we've had by ninety nine point nine percent of uh, college football fan bases by like, standards, we've had a ton of success over the years. Like getting to that next level is the most difficult because, like, you've kind of got you, you got a fan base that I like, feels like we're there. I it feels like it doesn't like I don't know. It's kind of we're in a weird spot, but. There's no doubt that under the current system, until it changes, you've got to pay. I that's that's the way it's going to be, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. And it may never get better; it may only get worse. I I've got some hope that there's going to be some guardrails and stuff put in, but as slow as college football moves, you just never know. So. You you got to find some ways right now to get get things happening, and it's good to hear they are. Yeah, and that is the thing. And I'll just be honest with you: the goal for them for twenty twenty four, from an NIL perspective for the football team, is nine million dollars. It's a lot of money, man. And, and they are looking; they're they're taking a different approach than a lot of other people. They want to prov- provide every guy on the team with an NIL opportunities, not just the top 20, 25 guys. So, and I, I know this portal cycle in particular, I think was an eye opening experience for some of the administration and some of the coaches that we just got to step things up. I, I think that, some of them had conversations with people that they trust that told them dollar amounts that were being thrown around. And they were surprised, like, oh, okay, this is, I mean, this is what it takes now. These, this is real money that these guys are actually getting. So I, I think that that caused a little bit of a, a shift and how they're operating this whole thing. And, and then my hope is that OU can get to, you know, in, in with the collective can get into a sustainable pattern with this, because I would, I would want it to be, sustainable year after year after year and is what Ole Miss and Tennessee are doing. Is that going to be sustainable year after year after year? I I don't know. Maybe, but maybe not. But I think if you're going to a certain number of donors and saying, Hey, give to the collective and it's not an outrageous amount of money year after year after year, then you can create something more sustainable and you combine that with the fact that you're going to be in the SEC now, you you still got you've got the sole mission stuff that does matter to a lot of parents and a lot of a lot of these recruits and portal guys like it. You you've got the fact that the staff has produced a lot of pro players. That if you can create a sustainable NIL fund, you combine all the other things the program has going for it, then I think that's where you can you can really build up the roster. Now, will it happen overnight like people want it to? I don't know, man. But I do think some of these things these other collectives are doing, aren't. It, it's just not sustainable in my mind. I could be wrong. Yeah. Well, But the goal is to get to that. To yeah, yeah, get to that like baseline, and then – maybe you get some portal guys to plug some holes like his luxuries. That's just kind of how I view it going, but 
this system also isn't very old. Like that, everyone involved is still learning a lot as this thing goes. It's not very old. It seems to change quite a bit, and I, the future is is kind of uncertain too. And I mean, there's been a lot of talk of college football moving to what would be a totally different scenario than what we have right now. And that would be like the athletic departments directly being able to operate the NIL stuff. And right. I can, I can understand that there's some, maybe some hesitancy at the moment to go all in on the current format. If you think there's going to be a new format, at some point in the future, maybe it's six months, maybe it's six years. I don't know what that is, but um, it's it's been kind of difficult to know exactly where to put all of your focus and all of your attention. So it's been tough. And, you know, Oklahoma has been in a position where like, every, you're, you're kind of going after the same people over and over and over for your NIL stuff. You're going after the same people for NIL as you are for facilities, as you are for all of the other things that that donors fund, and like it it can it can become taxing on all of those people, like everyone involved, like trying to raise the money, trying to distribute the money, you know, donating the money, the people that are actually doing it. It's it's a very it's a strange world when you think about it. Essentially, it's like it's an NFL team that has to go to their fan base every year to get donations to get to their salary cap so they can pay their salaries. It's like a it's a weird it's a weird system right now, the way it, it operates. It is. And I, I don't know how long this system is going to be in place. It does feel like change is coming. but. Until that change comes, everybody's got to everybody's got to do their part, and and yeah. I can just tell you, not going to get into the numbers or anything like that, but part of my wife's family, money that would normally be going to OU, is going to the collective, and I told them specifically, this money is only to be spent on offensive linemen. And I made it very clear. I say, if I find out it goes to anything else other than that, we're going to have a problem. Straight up. So trying to do my part, ladies and gentlemen. I, I mean, that, but it, it is strange where we're at. But the, and I asked the most influential people at OU, what is, what should we tell the fans? What's the best way? And every single one of them said that if OU fans, if they want to contribute to OU's NIL efforts, that they should give to Crimson and Cream Collective. That's what all these people said. Now, who knows how long this current system lasts? You would assume the university will be able to take this over at some point. But until it changes, that's that's where we're at. And I understand. The system isn't perfect. Crimson and Cream Collective isn't perfect. No collective out there is perfect. But, and OU is pushing for them to improve, believe me. But I am, that's what I'm being told. Crimson and Cream Collective, if, if OU fans want to give, that's be, that is the best way to do it as of now. And I will be straight up with you. I should have just quit radio and done this myself. I messed up, <laughs> OU fans. I'm sorry. That's my bad. But it is, it's where we're at right now. So I just, I saw a lot of, lot of stuff on Twitter about this entire situation. And it just, it's a little frustrating to me because I know how many people behind the scenes are working hard to try to make this a strength of OU's, and I, I want to make something clear. I think OU's NIL program is definitely one of the best in the country. Is it the best? 
No, I don't think it is. It's just from a total dollar fund standpoint. But the way that they're running it, the amount of effort that's going in there, the collaboration within the rules between people at the university and the people at the collective, I, I think it's I think it's being it's being run as good as really anything in the country. They just aren't capable of throwing some of these huge amounts of money as some of these guys are looking for. I I know there's been a lot of talk about the offensive linemen. Like, why can't we get any of these big time offensive linemen that that have entered the transfer portal? Guys are asking for a million dollars a year, man. At what what do you want them to do? A million dollars a year. A lot of them for uh, like guys that I mean, they may be good, but I you have to understand the way things work. As soon as a guy gets a million dollars a year for NIL and walks into the locker room, like, the offensive lineman right next to him is going to say, well, I'm out playing this guy. I should get a million one or a million two. It's, like, it's a dangerous road to go down. As soon as you start paying that big money, uh, and this is what I hate, is it changed the whole dynamic of the locker room. The hierarchy then all of a sudden tries to switch over to who makes the most money. And it's a could be a cancer. It can. I think a lot of people wonder... You know, what's it going to look like once there's some type of revenue sharing for the players? Whether it comes from the TV deal, from whatever. But I still think whether you want to label it NIL, whether you want to label it marketing, there's still going to be this competition. Because, hey, let's say that every college football player gets $50,000 per season from the TV deal. And that's just blanket across the board for the 65 or 70 teams that are in the top subdivision. Well, how are schools going to separate themselves from everyone else? It's still going to be NIL, but they're just going to label it as marketing. Hey, if you come here, we can get you X, Y, and Z marketing deals. This is, I I just don't think this piece of it, it'll just be labeled something else. It's, I I think it's a, it's a part of the future of college football. I don't think it's going anywhere. Yeah. I could be completely wrong, Ted, but I I think that this competition for players, NIL dollars, marketing dollars, whatever you want to label it, I don't think it's going anywhere. And that's why I... I think the most important thing for Oklahoma is that they're in the ballpark. Right? You just can't be completely wildly off. You right. got to be able to get in the ballpark, develop the guys, send them to the league, make them early round draft picks, and then just have that cycle repeat itself. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I think the the biggest point that you just mentioned is, yeah, let's let's assume the the revenue sharing thing does happen and for math purposes to make it easy let's say Oklahoma gets 100 million dollars from their SEC contract and 50 million of it goes to the players right well that's divided between the players you still have the NIL aspect of it and to be able cuz every SEC school is going to get the same amount to their players to be the cherry on top if you can have a 10 million dollar a year NIL fund that you're distributing them to the stars of your team. I mean, that's, it's still going to be, there's still going to be a money raising arm that helps people get the advantage over, uh, over others. And you're right. So to get it off and rolling right now and to get some momentum whenever that comes, cause this, this portion of it's not going to stop. I think that's, that was a really good point. I, I just, and, and I know that, the fans are frustrated that OU hasn't been able to pull more of these big time guys out of the portal. The coaches are frustrated too. 
everyone's frustrated. But what do, what do you do when a kid tells you, hey, like, I want to come to OU, but my parents, they, they've got me an NIL deal at another school between $900,000 and $1.2 million per season. What do you say, man? You, hey, I would, I would love for you to come. I can develop you into a pro. Maybe you're a first round pick, and that that money's peanuts compared to what you get if you come here. And I kind of think that, you know, for some some places, that's just going to have to be the the approach. But it's just tough. It it's tough getting some of these big time guys out of the portal with some of these deals. And this is real money. This is not fake money. Yeah, that these guys are getting. Uh, well. If a kid says that to you, all you do is put your hand out, say, hey, uh, good luck. I mean, and, you know, this is where, this is where you have to have, this is the same thing as the NFL. The NFL has a scouting department that scouts, obviously college players, scouts NFL players. And you got to find a way to get really good play out of guys that you don't pay as much. And in the long run, if you've got a school that's paying a million dollars a year for a guy and you can get the same level of play for a third of that, well, you're kicking their ass on the back end in the scouting department. So that's where the challenge comes. It's all of a sudden, it's like, how can we get more bang for our buck with some of these guys? Like that, that's the real goal now. And, you know, it's always been about recruiting, but now it's, it's a legitimate NFL style scouting department. And, you know, obviously your salary cap and all of that stuff. I mean, everyone's salary cap is different is, is kind of how this has to work and how you manage it. But, you know, that's, that's, that's the new kind of arms race is how good can you scout, negotiate and get guys on the field for less than, than what's going on around the country. And, and I will say uh, Crimson and Cream Collective, they're doing a good job of, of getting these deals done and then taking care of these guys. They're doing a good job. So I, I think that, and this is something we've talked about before, but moving forward, the keys for Oklahoma are evaluation and development. And, and there's a lot that goes into that development piece, right? Strength and conditioning, skill development at your position. That's, the, you know, coaches, it, like scheme is all part of that. And, and then you've got the big culture piece of it which I feel really good about the culture piece of it. Especially when you look at who didn't leave Oklahoma in the portal, like who didn't enter the portal. I think that tells you a lot about what BV and this staff are doing, but yeah, man, I was told that NIL was like the hot topic. So I figured that is what we should. We're here to give the people what they want, man. So I figured that's what we should talk about. It's the hot topic and it kind of, it's going to rule the off season these days. You know, the NIL transfer portal is until there's guidelines put in, which who knows when that's going to be, this is going to be the, the hot button topic in all of the different portal windows. Right. And now we've got an extended one with, with the coaches changes and stuff like that. So I'm sure we'll have another round of this post spring, whenever the next portal window opens. Well, how can I say this? I'd be surprised if if the Sooners aren't very active in the portal with some of the things that they're doing behind the scenes right now. Good. I think they understand the importance of having the type of roster you need to go into the SEC in year one and have a good season, especially when you look at our schedule. Yep. So... You know, think things are being done to try to bolster the roster. Okay. I like it. 
it just feels so weird still to talk about it like this, man. I know. It doesn't bother me. I love that the guys are making money, but it's just, there's no transparency. You just, you don't really know what you're bidding against. You don't, it's, it's you don't know if these guys are all getting paid, what they're being promised. I don't know. It's just a, it's a, cra- it's a crazy system. And it's like, can you imagine operating any business to where like the most valuable resource of your business is like, you can't really talk about how much they're you're paying for it. You can't talk about where you're getting the money necessarily. It's like, it's like, it's like, I don't know. It feels it. The whole thing feels so dirty. Doesn't it? I don't know if dirty's the right word. It just feels, it's just, it's awkward. Yeah. And it, I, I live by the saying awkward is you, what is what you make it. And this still just kind of feels awkward. Yeah. But the good thing is I think the OU staff and the leadership at OU in conjunction with the collective, I think they all are operating with a sense of urgency, which I, and I don't know if this little NIL talk is going to make fans feel better or worse. I don't know. Let us know people tweet us. Well, but, there's stuff in there that should make you feel a lot better. All right, there's they're making moves. They're making good moves. Yeah. Let's get to call your shot. Ask you guys the most important thing that happened this weekend for Oklahoma football. This one was pretty funny. From at Sooner Magic. Magic with a K. How about that? Mm-hmm. It says, Downs and Proctor left the SEC. Yeah. How about Caden Proctor coming out and saying Iowa hit him up in the middle of the season? Oops. No, Nothing's no. going to happen. Nothing's going to happen, right? Nothing's going to – I was not going to get punished. But No, not, not unless they go undefeated and threaten to threaten a lawsuit with the college football playoff committee. Then something will happen. That's whenever they come after you. We'll see. But, <laughs> yeah, so he's going back home to Iowa. He's from Iowa. But yeah, him admitting that in that interview was uh, that was an awesome clip. Clip that that spread on old X real quick, and then yeah. Caleb Downs to Ohio State. I love that so much. Put him in Jim Knowles' defense. He's going to use yeah. that guy as an absolute weapon. We saw some of the really creative stuff he did going back a couple years when he was at Oklahoma State using those mm-hmm. secondary pieces. Oh. He's going to be perfect in that system. Yeah, stud, stud, absolute stud. That's, um, but that is funny. Uh, and that's, that's part of what's really interesting about the whole NIL situation is the distribution of talent is, is changing, you know, and where exactly it's hard to gather all of it, but man, that, that is a, a, pretty decent amount of talent that's leaving the sec for another conference it's interesting very interesting and i i think that this other response it just it just makes me completely feel completely validated that we talked about what we talked about because it is this one is from admiral of stutzman army he has said i'm starting to become alarmed by all the dudes that texas is getting out of the alabama transfer portal and then Bob Stoops 2.0 V says, Oh, you striking out in the portal dot, dot, dot again. It's, it's not the portal's a hot topic right now, man. The portal NIL money, the collectives, like this is what, I guess this is what we talk about in late January now in college football. Yeah. Well, the real currency, the currency in college football for the longest time was facilities history tradition to some degree uh development system that you're running and and how you fit into that system and then like uh, like the atmosphere the call it like all of those things it's starting to be nfl again i don't i don't money's going to be number one and what's going to be number two is going to be several rungs down the ladder. You go back to, you watch NFL free agency. 
most guys are going to take the biggest deal wherever that is. It doesn't matter like where the city is, what the weather's like. They're going to go where they get the most money and make everything else work. And college football is moving that direction if it's not already there. And frankly, that's that hurts Oklahoma. It's something that you're going to have to be able to overcome in 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 some fashion and Hopefully this, the moves they're making now is going to help that. I'm with you, man. All right. Now let's move on to what people actually listen to this podcast for. And that's for us to talk about basketball. (laughs) First loves travel stops is now offering a nationwide 10 cent per gallon discount on gas and auto diesel. Just download the loves connect app and scan your barcode at the prompt on screen and watch that price drop 10 cents per gallon. Across the country, the Loves Connect app unlocks exclusive deals can help any traveler plan their route or meal on the highway. So before you hit the road, be sure to download the Loves Connect app to save 10 cents per gallon and experience the country's best highway hospitality at Loves Travel Stops. Loves all says you covered if you forget your phone, charger, or headphones with their expanded mobile to go zone. And of course, don't forget to grab yourself some of that delicious Java Hamore. Celebrate with Schooner All-American L, the official craft beer of OU Athletics from Coop Ale Works. Named after the iconic Sooner Schooner that races across Owen Field after an OU score, you can join in on the celebration with an ice-cold beer from Coop Ale Works. You can enjoy it at the Palace on the Prairie, at OU Athletic Events, at the bar, at the tailgate, and in the comfort of your own home. For more information on Schooner All-American L, visit schoonerl.com. Must be 21 to purchase. Please drink responsibly. Schooner All-American Ale, the taste of game day. And Simple Modern is an Oklahoma drinkware company founded by OU grads. They have fantastic products, and that's why they've found tremendous success selling their products at Target, Walmart, Amazon, and SimpleModern.com. I use Simple Modern Cups. My wife uses Simple Modern Cups. My kids use Simple Modern Cups. Their products are for the entire family. Also, If you're a small business owner looking for some marketing swag for current and future customers, they make excellent customized products. Check them out at simplemodern.com today. Football guys talking basketball, FGTB. Ted, let's start with the Sooners. 2-0 since we last recorded beat West Virginia on Wednesday night, which now that West Virginia just beat Kansas, looks like a much better win. Right, yeah. beat them 77-63 on Wednesday night. Protected home court against a team that I don't think a lot of people would say are in the upper echelon of Big Twelve basketball. But the big win that everyone's talking about came Saturday afternoon. The Sooners beat Cincinnati 69-65. Nice to move to fifteen and three, three and two in Big Twelve play. And Ted, that felt just like an absolutely massive road win for Porter Moser's squad. So difficult in this conference to get road victories. I mean, just look around at what Kansas has now lost to UCF and West Virginia on the road. I mean, that's, uh, I did not see that coming. I know. I know it's, it's, I mean, we've always known it's tough. Um, and this year is, is no exception. Big win. What a wild game. Like the first, 15 minutes of this basketball game was damn near unwatchable. (laughs) Uh, I was sitting there watching it going, is anyone going to hit a shot? Anyone at all? There was like five minutes to go in the first half. And it was like 11 to seven or something like that. It's crazy. And then we got started picking up from that point on and started making some shots. A uh, really tight game at the half, just kind of like you expected, and executed well in the second half, man. I thought, I, I thought OU showed a lot of toughness in this game. Uh, first of all, Cincinnati's really good at home, and that place—I've never been there for a game, but just from the couch, that place sounded like it was rocking. Yeah. So I, I thought that they did a good job of just handling that atmosphere. I thought they did a really good job competing on the glass, playing with toughness. Cincinnati's got some good size in the front court. They do. They do. They got some big dudes. And Sooners out-rebounded them. And I thought they really displayed some toughness. Uh, Javion McCollum, 
led the way with 16 points. I didn't think he shot it particularly well, but I do want to give that guy credit. He rolled the absolute hell out of his ankle when he landed on that guy's foot, when he made the floater, taped that thing back up, got back out there and just kept playing, man. I love that. I love him showing that type of toughness. I love seeing that. And while it was a struggle for him in the first half, Otega Owe was massive, especially early in the second half with the offensive production. I, I know he missed the free throw on the one-on-one late. Not great. Not what you want. But that production that he had in the second half, it was huge. And I thought, I thought it was the difference in the game, the way that he stepped up, made some shots there. Uh, I thought that, you know, he, it was kind of an up-and-down performance for him. But that stretch where he got it cooking, massive for this team. Yeah. No, it was it was great. Um, man, the efficiency was better. I haven't looked at the box score numbers exactly, but, you know, the turnovers and points off turnovers have been what was, like, really killing us in the games where we didn't play well. And it felt better. Uh, it felt like more of a controlled and efficient type of game than it has been. The I, I thought that they valued the basketball better. Yeah. But I thought it was as gross of an offensive performance as I'd seen from him. Yeah. And sometimes you just got to win the gross ones. And that's what it was. I mean, especially you get what you had two points. I mean, you go on the road and a guy that talented only has two points and you walk out of there with a win. Sure. Yeah. I mean, now you got to get more out of you, but free throws are maybe the difference. 16 for 18 at the line. Meanwhile, Cincinnati missed eight free throws. I mean, that stuff really matters in tight games. So it wasn't pretty, but they they found it. They found a way in that second half. And there's a lot of teams throughout Big 12 play that haven't found a way to win the ugly ones on the road. So I, just, I think it says a lot about those guys. That was a, that was a heck of a win, man. I know it's, it's one of those where, I still don't know how good they are. I don't know how good anyone in the Big 12 is. I know. It's like you get such a wide swing of of what teams look like home versus on the road. And, you know, I guess that's college basketball in a nutshell, though, is is it's pretty pretty volatile what what type of performances you're going to get. I know we're still what we're ranked number 15 or so. I mean, I guess that's probably about right. But, you know, sometimes I feel like, man, we look like a top 10 team. And then other times I look like, yeah, are we really even the top 25? So it's just, it's kind of hard for me to to put my finger on it. But I, the one thing I like is the athleticism, you know, and if we can continue to take care, value the basketball, as you said, if you, if we hit foul shots the way we did and you know, score and win the games at home. I mean, that's, that's what it's going to boil down to is you can't lose serve at home. I mean, that that's, that's what this conference really is. Speaking of that, OU Texas in Norman Tuesday night. Now it's an early tip, ladies and gentlemen, 6 PM. But if you got to leave work early, leave work early, got to get there. I'm expecting that to be one of the best atmospheres in Norman that we've seen in a while. And Texas coming off a big win over Baylor. We'll see if Rodney Terry is able to handle the amount of horns downs that are going to be thrown in the building. That was, and he ended up apologizing for it after the Baylor game, right? He ended up doing the right thing, but the way that he responded to that in the moment with those UCF players, that was, oh, that was so bad, man. And I like Rodney Terry. I've had the opportunity to interview him several times on Big 12 Radio. Seems like just a a, a quality man and just had a, had a bad moment there. Yeah, I think he was probably just kind of feeling the heat. I think at that point they had lost three out of the last four. Um, they had just blown a really big lead. I, big I think lead. he was just pissed at himself and at his team and yeah. took it out on UCF's guys. Exactly. And We've all had it, those moments. It, 
uh, probably looked back on it and obviously was like, ah, that was probably not very good, but you know, congratulations. You're going to get a hundred times more horns down than you would have for the rest of the season. Um, That's just the way things work. It was funny. Uh, You know, he was talking about class and, you know, doing things that were classless. And then he said, we don't jump up and down. Like we just won the national championship and then their players are storming the court when Tyrese Hunter makes, and that was an awesome, awesome finish to win that game against Baylor. I mean, basically guys like horizontal in the air as he shoots it up off the glass, but they're running out on the court, jumping up and down. And everyone say, what, what happened to the whole, we don't, jump up and down like we won the national championship. You know, we, we handle it with class stuff. Rodney, what happened? That's, that's how it works. That's how it works. It's well, a good reminder. This whole thing's supposed to be fun. <laughs> Don't be a fun hater, man. Don't be a fun right. hater. Those UCF guys weren't doing anything wrong. They were like amongst each other. Maybe they were flashing horns down to a few Texas fans in the crowd. They were just excited because they got a massive road win. Don't be a fun hater. <laughs> That's how it goes. And um, yeah, you better learn to enjoy it because Tuesday night, it's going to kind of be the, uh, the entire game, the entire uh, situation for you. Yeah. That's going to be fun. Big one. Got to win that one. If you're Oklahoma, let's talk some thunder. So beat the jazz on Thursday night, right? Red hot Utah jazz. Now I love that. Thunder got out to a quick start in that game. And I think a few of the Thunder players were sick. Dort didn't even play. Uh, Shea looked like he was a little worn down as well. Still dropped 31. But I just, I thought the Thunder did a lot of good things offensively. Attacked Utah zone when they jumped in it. But Ted, looking back at that game, Jalen Williams, J-Dub, my goodness. I mean, what a fourth quarter for that guy. Dude is an absolute stud, and I don't even know what to say about him anymore. He's been on a tear like the last, what, four or five games. He's really cranked it up. He's been one of the best players in the league the last five games. Yeah. I, I mean, he's just been fantastic. I, I I just can't believe we got him and Jet Holmgren in the same draft. <laughs> it makes me so happy. But even Casey Wallace in that game may have hit the biggest shot of the game. That three late, but all eyes were on Minneapolis on Saturday night for the Thunder, right? Best record in the West versus the second best record in the West. All the Thunder did was go in there and beat him, Ted. What's up? Now, was did they go to Chet's high school? Was that before the game? Yes. That was so they that was pretty I'm cool. I'm guessing that was Friday night. Okay. I'm guessing that was on a Friday because they had a game Thursday and then had a game Saturday. So my, my guess is that was a Friday night affair. That's pretty Everyone cool. Everyone just wants to point that. out that Giddy wasn't there. Gosh, just can't enjoy, <laughs> just can't give Chet props. There. Everyone's like, where's Giddy? Where's Giddy? I don't know, man. I don't know where the guy was. Who cares? <laughs> Just brutal. People are still booing Giddy, man. Oh, that guy. It's had a tough year. He's playing better though. Playing a lot better. Yeah. But I as bet. far as as far as what we saw on the court, physical game. It was a physical game. Uh, had a bit of a playoff feel to it. And I just, I thought the Thunder really showed what they're made of. They were down double digits early in the fourth quarter. And. It was just such a fun game to watch with a bizarre finish. Dort just makes a horrible mistake (laughs) and fouls Anthony Edwards on the three-point attempt with, I don't know, three seconds to go. And Anthony Edwards seems like one of those guys that are going to walk to the free throw line, hit all three, and then go win it in overtime. That's just kind of the vibe he puts off. And he missed that first one, and I went, oh, my goodness. And then he missed the second one. I went, oh, my goodness. Then, of course, I had to miss the third one intentionally. Ted, I was stunned because he doesn't seem like a lemon booty type of guy, but got real puckered up, couldn't get it done. 
What a shame. Yeah, everything changes when you miss that first one, and all of a sudden it that basket's moving on you. Um, he looked at the rim like, why have you done this to me, rim? Probably because some of the abuse that he puts it through. <laughs> That's that dude true. can absolutely fly. <laughs> but I, as I was watching the game, it got into the fourth quarter, I was starting to think, I think the Thunder may get out mathed in this game. T-Wolves shot. 13 more threes than them, hit six more. But Thunder made up for it getting to the free throw line. 30 of 35 from the line. Took great care of the basketball. Minimal turnovers against what I believe is one of the NBA's best defenses. Thunder really didn't shoot it well at all. But I think it just says a lot about their grit and their defense that they're able to go in there and get this win come from behind and I was watching the post game interview and it flashed up at the bottom and I can't remember what it said, but they've got a bunch of come from fourth quarter, double digit come from behind victories this season. Yeah. I think over the last, I want to say it's over the last two years, they're tied for the most in the NBA, like coming yeah. back from being down double digits. I could have completely messed that stat up, but I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Yeah. Well, grit and like to do so and not, have like a really good shooting night you're playing defense you're taking advantage of your foul shots like just winning in different ways i guess is uh always a, a nice little stat to have chet is he's doing such a good job protecting the rim staying vertical on his block attempts he's just he's got such a massive impact on the defensive end for this team. SGA continues to build his MVP case. Another 33, including that step back with about a minute 15 to go to take the lead. That was sweet. It's those types of moments that can build an MVP case. And then you mentioned the post-game interview, man. This team's chemistry is, it's great. I mean, you've got J Dub and J Will and Chet just lurking behind Shay as he's doing his post game interview with Nick Gallo on the court. I I don't even know what they're doing, just kind of giggling, just kind of <laughs> I don't know, just having fun, man. It's these guys are having fun, and it's extremely fun to watch them. And yes, it's really fun to watch them winning. Yep. That's that's what makes it everything about it right now, man. It just feel it feels great. And all of a sudden, all-star break's getting close. Thunder got a chance to have the, have the best record in the West at the all-star break. Yeah. We'll see, but. Uh, it's exciting. Hey, do you, what, do you know the, the details of the Amazon thing? No. It, I, I saw that they were acquiring the Bally stuff. Yeah. Did, I read the article, but I, the article just made me more confused. Right. That's what I was saying. It's like, I, I don't know when or I, how this is all going to translate. Is it going to be on Amazon? I would assume it's going to be on Amazon Prime. Right. Right. Like the app on your TV. But is it going to be a separate thing you have to pay for? Or is it just going to be built into your Prime subscription? That's where I was. Yeah. I've got questions. I'll say this. I think people would gladly just have it be on there as opposed to what they've had with Bally's. I think a lot of people have had a lot of bad experiences. I think so. I mean, it seems like that's the way things are going anyway. So it's not shocking that it happened. I just, I was wondering if you had seen or heard any clarity on it. And like the way I followed it was it's just absorbed into Amazon prime, but who knows? I, I don't know. I don't know if anyone knows. I don't even know if Amazon knows. <laughs> right. They were just, they have so much money. They're like, yeah, let's buy it. That's fine. Right. <laughs> I, my hope, uh, I continue to hope that Thunder games will be easier for all Thunder fans to watch. And I'm hoping that, you know, moving forward, and we talked about the Griffin media deal and having the Friday night games uh, on local television here and in Tulsa and, you know, some of the surrounding areas close to Oklahoma. I, I hope there's more of that moving forward. I just, I don't know enough about the TV deals 
yeah. and the details in those to know if that's, if that's a possibility. But I, I just think with how good this team's going to be for the next 10 years, it, it's really important that Thunder fans can watch the games and it not be like really complicated to watch them. Yep, I agree. Easy access. Let's finish up with our winners and losers of the weekend. But first, all you grill masters out there, listen up. Didier Ranch delivers premium quality beef that is 100% raised in Oklahoma right to your front door. Go to DidierRanch.com, D I D I E R Ranch.com to order one of their premium quality beef boxes. And use promo code OKLAHOMA15 for 15% off your order. Filet, ribeye, New York strip, sirloin, steak, burgers, they got it all, and they ship anywhere in the continental U.S., and Oklahomans get deliveries in just one to two days. The only thing better than having a lot of premium beef on the O-line and D-line is having premium beef delivered right to your front door. Didier Ranch, tradition tastes better. Our boss box has arrived. I'm really excited. Oh, yeah. Oh, I can't yeah. wait. I'm really excited. But make sure you also head to the garage for hand smashed patties, butter toasted buns, and some ice cold beer. It's the perfect spot to watch any big game. And with all garage locations being open to 10 p.m. or later every night, it is the go to late night spot. Maybe you can go watch some Thunder games there if you're having trouble. Visit eatatthegarage.com to find a location near you and order online from the garage in your neighborhood. As always, Ted. Kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the weekend? Well, I know the game didn't go the way he wanted it to, but I got to go with Baker Mayfield. I mean, is there a better consolation than hanging out and partying with Ric Flair? <laughs> Did you see, you saw that tweet, I'm assuming. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was awesome. What a, what a brutal way to end that game. Otherwise, great game. Awesome back and forth. Um, but, Man, that I hated the way it closed off for Baker because it's it's the last thing you're going to remember about his season that otherwise was awesome. Just a bad throw at the end. Yep. I feel like balls go in the right place. Just he was he was so good on the drive before. Yeah. Just dart after dart after dart. And for the Lions to not finish the job and leave the door open for him, man. I, that was brutal. Yep. Because brutal. he played well. He played well, man. Yeah, he played well. Um, I still think that the conversation about Baker Mayfield and Tampa Bay is like, they've got to extend him. I, I would be shocked if they didn't. I mean, there's nowhere else to go for him. So they're going to extend Baker. Uh, he's going to make a bunch of money. And, you know, they still have a ton of cap space available to go out and add some pieces. And, you know, we'll see what happens with them in the draft. But was a really good football game. How about the back and forth late? I mean, all of a sudden, it just looked like, a, I don't know, old school Big 12 game there in the fourth quarter, up and down the field for both teams. That was fun. Yeah, I I thought Jared Goff was really good. Yeah. I, I he think that some of his arm talent, didn't he? Yeah. And Jameer Gibbs. Is, is he the most sudden guy in the NFL other than Tyreek Hill? Yeah. He's, I mean, he gets going north and south. He's got great change of direction, runs through tackles, but you know, he's great, but it starts with that offensive line. That offensive line is tough, man. They did a good job uh, building that team from the inside out on both sides of the ball. I, I think that you could see you could see the difference. You know, Goff was well protected. Uh, Lions did a really nice job up front, identifying pressures, getting everything blocked up. And meanwhile, on the other side of things, it was clear whether it was the offensive line or Baker, like they just were not on the same page when it came to how they were picking up some of those pressures that the Lions were bringing. They they struggled in empty protection. Baker struggled knowing – it looked like he was struggling knowing who the unblocked guy was going to be and, like, w when he needed to get the ball out. It was strange to see. Yeah, 
Well, somehow it felt like the unblocked guy always ended up being the best defensive player on the other side of the ball. <laughs> Which sometimes you got to break some rules and you got to send the, the three man slide that way and let the other two guys go to for the most dangerous two on that side and go two on three. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, leaving Aiden Hutchinson unblocked, unabated to the quarterback is it is a strategy. Which I, I am really impressed with how good he is he look and he looks like he's getting better and better he's got a great get off he's incredibly strong i don't know like one of the first plays of the game the first series for them defensively he came off and just like two hand punched that right tackle in the pads and sent him like going backwards i was like that may be a long day but uh what a what a well-played game on both sides of the ball is plenty of plenty of um exciting stuff up and down the field and how about Detroit man impressive our former employer headed to the NFC championship game it was kind of a win-win for us yeah it was hey if the Bucks win we're super happy for Baker if the Lions win we both played there uh, those fans are fantastic it's been a long long time and Dan Campbell's the band so it was it was a wildly entertaining football game. It was. And, you know, I, it, this is not like a, it, at least I uh, got to be careful, but this doesn't feel like a one-off flute for Detroit. They are set up. They've got some really good, really young players and they're in a good position. They got a good quarterback. You mentioned how good golf was. Uh, his deal's not ridiculous. I don't think I have to go back and look at it. Uh, but he's under contract, so uh, it feels like they're set up for some long-term success. I, I love how aggressive Campbell was in some of those spots. Like going forward on fourth and one with a little over three and a half minutes to go mm -hmm. there in the third quarter, just did no hesitation. That That instills confidence in those guys. Now, the only other thing from this game, Big analytics debate there when the Bucks chose to go for two, and everyone was going, "What are you doing?" But including me, I I don't. I mean, I I understand the probability and the percentages, and that the sheet, the book, whatever you want to call it, says go for two right there. But I remain adamant that analytics doesn't factor in vibes all the time. And the vibes were high. If you just kick the extra point there, everyone's feeling good about things, but they didn't get it. Just go live fade. How about that? How about the call on the two point yeah. conversion? That was, oof. I missed it. I, you know, they score the touchdown. I walk out of the room and I come back. It's like, what, <laughs> what happened? What happened? What's going on here? Uh, I, I don't, I don't get that at all. I mean, I don't even. I don't even, I mean, I'm not a, I, I'm not saying I don't believe in analytics, but whenever they tell me that I say the whole system is screwed. <laughs> Ultimately ended up getting the ball back. Yep. And just unfortunate that Baker wasn't able to put the drive together to make it a really, really suspenseful ending. Yeah, I know, but still a great game. And um, like I said, uh, a, a hangout with Ric Flair is a hell of a consolation prize for Bake. Yeah, I pulled up the tweet. He said, Baker Mayfield, we've only, we've only met once. As of today, I have so much respect for you and the Buccaneers. You played your heart out. You are a badass. I live <laughs> in Tampa. I don't have your number. I would love to hang out with you. You're such a badass. I'm so <laughs> proud to say that I'm a Buccaneers fan. To the whole Buccaneers team, God bless you. You went places you weren't supposed to go. Next year, let's kick ass. Finishes it with a woo. I can't do it. I can't do the Ric Flair woo. I, yeah. I've tried. I, I don't have it in me. But that did, it is pretty good. And he attached a picture of Baker to it, which is pretty cool. Awesome. Yeah, that's cool. Um, you know, that was... A, a nice run by the Bucks. Not expected. Whenever they kind of, like, as the off season unfolded, it felt like this is kind of a bridge year to try and get us to something else. And 
played good ball, went through a little bit of struggles there mid to late season, but um, pushed through it, won a playoff game, had a really good chance at a second one, but uh, all in all, really good season for, for Baker and Tampa Bay. He made a lot of money this year. Which is it's very important. I, I, <laughs> I'm happy for him. I think, I think this year will end up being labeled as a massive success for Baker Mayfield. Yes. Yep. And now he's friends with Rick Flair, apparently. So sweet. There you go. There you go. Did Tampa not have a timeout at the end of the game? Did you see that? Detroit took an E. The graphic said they had a timeout. I'm just guessing the graphic was wrong because they could have called a timeout and made them either. I can't remember what yard line they were on, either field, a field goal attempt or a punt. They didn't use the timeout. The graphic, it the, the score bug definitely said they had a timeout. I don't know. Um, it's I hard guess to it, think that that was the case, right? Or they just threw in the towel. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, who do you have as your loser of the weekend? Buffalo Bills. Mm. What the hell happened in that football game? What did I just watch? Uh, I, you've got, you're going right down the field. You got the thing, you got a, at least a tie in the bag. They got way too conservative. And I don't know. I thought I say too conservative, maybe too aggressive. I don't know. Allen was just kind of whipping the ball down the field there. I, they had plenty of time to just continue to march the football like they have been the entire day. And they leave it up to the kicker, and I mean, that looked like a a very poor tee shot that just, whew, I mean, it was in, and then it was gone. That was crazy. But Le- left the club face open? Or... Left the club face open. That, that was nuts. But, you know, the special teams-wise, it's almost like, because they got away with that horrendous fake punt. What, what is happening with that fake punt? I, so this is kind of what my thought process was. I think it was fourth and five. And I would assume McDermott's thinking was, our defense is not stopping the Chiefs. We got to steal an extra possession right here. But if that's your line of thinking, man, just leave Josh Allen out on the field. Just go for it. Right. Yeah. Just leave your best player out on the field and put it in his hands. Don't snap it to DeMar Hamlin <laughs> on a fake punt. And that thing was dead the entire yeah. time. That thing was, and that was not a DeMar Hamlin joke. People don't, don't try to pin that on me. <laughs> it was not. I did. The, uh. the play was dead instantly. I mean, there's penetration everywhere. It was a, it was just a horrible play, a horrible play, and they got away with it. And but you know, it came back on that that field goal. Uh, but another great game. I mean, tough, physical football game. Both teams running the ball like crazy. Uh, Josh Allen was, you know, a big threat with the running uh, in the running game. That was a lot of fun. There were some high-level throws, and a lot of them didn't even get caught. <laughs> the one that Josh Allen had to Stephon Diggs where he didn't catch it, I was I was impressed that the cameraman kept it in the frame. Yeah. That thing, I mean, that was, it looked like he shot it out of a T-shirt cannon. <laughs> <laughs> that was an unbelievable throw. Yeah. But I, I would say... When you look at that game, the biggest winner is Miko Hardman. Because if they wouldn't have pulled it out, what are you doing reaching the ball out? It's first down, brother. Crazy. First of all, why are they giving Miko Hardman the ball down there anyways? Just give it to Pacheco and let him do his high knees and run dudes over into the end zone. Guy is just a he was just a freight train in that game. He was. He was late. I mean, 
after the missed field goal, I mean, you've got a you got an opportunity to stop him. Like, we know what's coming. They're running the football, and he runs right through the middle of everyone for a nine yard gain on first down. And at that point, forget about it. Patrick Mahomes is pretty good on the road in the playoffs. He was clean. He was efficient. Made some really my, uh, nice plays, smart throws. Um, he had a couple of really nice balls out there on the on the perimeter that he threw. High level quarterback play going on in that one. That was fun. And the wide receivers caught the rock, made plays on the football for him, and you may want to cover Travis Kelsey. How how you leave that guy wide open? Not entirely sure how that happens. It's a mystery. It's it's the damnedest thing I've ever seen in my life. Every week, you know, like whenever everything is on the line, there's 87 running down the field with no one within, like no one's even in the screen covering him. It's crazy. I, I feel for Buffalo fans. Wide right. Mm. They hurts. were throwing the ice at the wrong team at the end of the game. That's true. <laughs> Did you see Chris Jones? Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's going to be a it's going to be a scene in Orchard Park tonight. There are going to be people oh, yeah. drinking their sorrows away. It's going to be a little dicey there. Yeah. Hey, we even had a we even had a Kelsey brother making the whole thing about themselves. This time it was Jason. You know it always happens, which my wife couldn't get enough of it. She loved it. She was sending me pictures every time he was coming out of the booth or whatever was happening. He was just jumping in and out of the suite. Like a maniac, but also there's no way that guy should retire if he could still move like that. I was about to, uh, that was a pretty pretty athletic getting back in. Yeah, nice. He's he's got years left him in left in him. I'm telling you, but he's yep. just he's going to capitalize on their their media rise and get. Oh, yeah. he, I don't know if he's going to be in the Amazon booth next year or something. He's going to have a big gig next oh, yeah. year, and he's going to be great oh. at it, but. Him just hammering beers while they're trying to show Taylor Swift, like the director, can you get Kelsey out of the shot? He's in the shot. We're trying to show Taylor. And he's just like drinking beers in the background. Fat belly in the back, fat hairy guy in the back. That was <laughs> great. It was great. It'll be the Chiefs sixth AFC championship game in a row. Yep. Mahomes has never not made the AFC championship as a starter. Incredible. He and, is and in a year where you know they had they had problems and it and it's like it's happened the last couple of years. It's like, man, I don't know. They just they're not the same, they don't look right, and uh they just keep making it, keep finding a way to win. This year did it behind a uh I mean obviously Mahomes was great, but their defense, you know, helped them out a ton. I, I thought that you know, the defense has been the strength of the team this season, but I thought the offense is what went and got, went and got them this win. The defense was struggling to stop Buffalo. Yeah, couldn't stop that struggling. run. Couldn't stop the run, but, dude, when you have a play like Hardman had, a catastrophic error like that, ball, you fumble the ball through the end zone for a touchback, you normally don't win the game. And... They were able. They were able to find a way. It's impressive. I, that atmosphere had to be insane for them to go handle all of that, walk out of there with a the win. That's it's impressive. I mean it. It's the Buffalo from my childhood. Mm. The field goal, the field goal situation, just totally the worst way to lose a game and to end the season. I feel sorry for the kicker, but just make the kick. I mean, that's, that's it. Just make the kick. It was a bad miss too. Bad. It wasn't one of those. Oh, like it goes, did it go directly over the pylon or not? That thing took us hard, right? Hard, right? Yeah. And honestly, Tyler Bass kind of robbed us of an awesome Mahomes moment. Yeah, that's not the way we wanted it to end. No, you don't. Want, you don't want that game to end, kneeing it out. 
Like, that's the thing about today's games. You had two great games, but the endings just kind of went right at the, right at the, you know, the minute and a half mark. Still great. Great weekend of NFL football. All right, let's get to great matchups next week. No doubt about it. All right, let's get to my winner and loser of the weekend. But first, elevate your tailgate with Chapel Supply and Equipment in Oklahoma City. Chapel Supply and Equipment has generators and inverters on hand that will give you all the power you need so you can take your tailgate to the next level. They've also got top-of-the-line heaters to keep you warm during those cold tailgates later in the season. They're Oklahoma-owned and operated. Elevate your tailgate by calling 405-495-1722 or visit chapelsupply.com. That's C H A P P E L L supply.com. And attention, business owners, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order on a cost effective, comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. If your business partners with Insurica, You'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. And head to OpolisClothing.com for our podcast merchandise and the best OU gear out there. That's O-P-O-L-I-S Clothing.com. Use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off. That's OpolisClothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. My winner of the weekend, Baltimore Ravens. Now, that first half, that was interesting. Special teams touchdown for the Texans. Tied at 10 at halftime. Seemed like all the pressure was building on the Ravens. But they do. They did what good teams do. They dominated the second half. Dominated the fourth quarter. Ted, I thought Lamar Jackson was so dang good in the second half. Put the team on his back, you know, throwing the football, but running the football. That dude is such a weapon with his legs. I I don't even know how you defend some of the stuff that they draw up. QB, pin, pull, sweep, and then throw a pop pass off of it. Like, yeah. for a touchdown, what do you do? Yeah, when the brutal. guy it, when the guy can run like that, they had they ran a play. They fake power, so they're faking power to the front side. Lamar Jackson keeps it. The tackle on the backside and on the backside of the backside tackle on power reaches and hinges. He reaches and hinges and then pulls out, and is the lead blocker on what I guess you would call a boot. For Lamar Jackson to touch that. I I don't know how you defend that. Well, there's a lot of things that they do that you can't defend. It, it, like the the worst thing that usually happens is a drop back pass and he gets to the top of the drop and just pulls it down. And before you can like blink, he's gone ten yards upfield. It's like it, I mean, it is so fast. It's crazy. And to tackle that guy out there in open space is, you know, you're just lucky if you get a hand on him and can get his balance off and he'll go down. It's just, it's brutal. He's incredible. And, you know, they've they've just got a really solid all around football team with maybe the most explosive player in the league at quarterback. That is, that's really hard to stop. That defense they've got, it's well documented up. You know, at this point, that's a physical group. Brutal. I mean, Brutal. there was some hitting going on. And on the other side of things, the Texans, I, I think you got to be really encouraged by the season if you're a Texans fan. Yeah. And I thought, all things considered, that weather did not look very good. I, I thought C.J. Stroud played well. There was pressure all around him. And I thought he handled it well. Once again, that, that Ravens defense is legit, man. So you got to feel pretty dang good about D'Amico Ryan's in year one as the head coach. Feel like you've got your franchise guy in Stroud, and 
Now you've got w- Will Anderson had a heck of a rookie season as well. Like you, you're feeling really good. You have some of those foundational pieces. If you're the Texans, a lot to be excited about. But clearly, really Baltimore just a much better team at this point. Yeah, and I think that don't they still have a couple more draft picks from the Watson? Yeah, from that trade. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but when you when you look that promising, when you got a quarterback on a rookie deal, hey, the window is wide open for a championship because you can allocate a lot of capital to other guys in free agency, keeping big name guys, not letting anyone out. They're set up to have a nice little four or five year run here. No doubt. All right, for my loser of the weekend. Thought about going with court storming. <laughs> Do you see that? Yeah. I tweeted about it. I am stunned by the amount of people that are like, she, she's got to keep her eyes open. She's got to keep her head on a swivel. No, no, you don't. Those people aren't supposed to be down there. And in all seriousness, I don't know if people, a lot of people realize how big of a deal Caitlin Clark is. She's the biggest star in college basketball. Everywhere wow. Iowa goes, everywhere Iowa goes, sells out. She's got her own cereal. Like she is an absolute gold mine. And she's yep. also a baller. That game they lost in overtime, she had a casual 45. <laughs> that's the is thing she, that's being lost. She had 45 points in the loss. And she's been great. For, like This isn't like last year thing. She's been great the entire time she's been there. All right. Yeah, she's she's definitely incredible. So is she hurt bad? Like, what's the? I, I think she's fine, but yeah. you know she kind of spun out of it. But it is it's just one of those things. Court storming is already at times, you know, kind of a hot button issue. You've got the biggest star in all of college basketball, men's or women's, falling because they run into someone that was storming the court. That's just, it's going to lead to some serious conversations. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. If she was actually hurt, could you imagine? uh, They would sue the hell out of Ohio State. Oh, yeah. She's going to be the first pick of the draft. Yeah. She's going to be a star in the WNBA. Like, a star. I'm surprised we, like, that hasn't happened to some degree before. Maybe it has. I don't know, but. Yeah, I mean, because you're responsible for secur- the security at your own, you know, uh, event. And, yeah, if someone, like, that's worth that much money got hurt out there, yeah, I would imagine there would be a lawsuit coming. Oh. Thankfully, it sounds like she's fine. And, and I will say this. A lot of people responding with you know, just just being rude. If it was an OU athlete. We'd be pissed. Pissed. Yep. So I'm just saying, not cool, man. I mean, it's not you storm the court, but just have some damn awareness and don't run into the biggest star in all of college basketball, you idiot. I like watching her play. Don't touch her. <laughs> no, they had it. They were doing the selfie, the running selfie. Oh, like, oh my gosh. <laughs> we're just. Steam rolls, Caitlin Clark. Just ridiculous, man. Uh, oh, that's that's funny. funny. All right. My, my loser of the weekend, though, the Green Bay Packers. Mm. Missed opportunity. They had it. Missed opportunity. I mean, they were running it. They ran it so well on that San Francisco defense. 49ers didn't play well. Brock Purdy was off. But Jordan Love and the Packers, Ted, they just couldn't finish the job, man. What in the hell was that throw? I, mean, I yeah. don't know. It was it was terrible. Don't throw it late over the middle. Yeah, I understand the rule of thumb. But don't throw it late over the middle when the guy's surrounded by three people. He wasn't even open. Wasn't even close to being open. The only thing that was worse than that throw was Dre Greenlaw trying to return the interception. <laughs> what was he doing? Right. Ten minutes. 
like sometimes you'll see a guy like make a couple of moves and then enough guys are doing this that finally he's like, okay, he goes down. No, he wasn't going down. I, I had no horse in the race. <laughs> I did not care who won the game and I'm screaming, screaming, get down, get what? down. What are you doing? <laughs> it was baffling, man. But yes, that, that sequence, just a brutally Terrible decision from Jordan Love, only to be confounded by Drake Greenlaw. I, I don't know. Did he think he was going to take it back? I don't know. But it was, it was a very interesting play to steal the win. I. It seems problematic that Brock Purdy just apparently can't throw the ball in the rain. Seems problematic. Yeah. Now, it probably won't rain the rest of the playoffs, but. When you're in the middle of your drop and it's in your head that much where you're reaching for your towel. I've never seen that, man. No, no. He Brock Purdy is, he can make some nice throws. For he's, sure. a, he's a talented player, but he has limitations. Like, This is stuff like this is not new. I mean, we've been watching him for six years now do all kinds of weird things, right? And, you know, you're in the NFL playoffs and he's hitting guys in the chest with the football on the other team and lucky that they weren't catching it. You just think about the way that Mahomes looked. Complete control. He was awesome against Buffalo. Josh Allen was awesome. I mean, they ended up losing the game, but the guy was making plays. Think about how good Goff looked. Yeah. Accurate, he full looked control. And then you think about how Purdy looked. And then the impact that Lamar had. Like You look at the 49ers, if that defense can't figure it out, they by far have the worst quarterback left. Oh, yeah. So, and I feel like it's going to end with like one of those Brock Purdy type plays that we've seen before. The falling down, getting sacked, throw it backwards over your head. Type you of love play. that. You love that play so much. Well, I mean, it's because it, I always reference it because it's not like a. He does stuff like that often. It's his it's his his main problem. He'll he'll play, you know, eighty five percent of his snaps are good, solid snaps, and then fifteen percent it's like, hey, what the hell's going on here, dude? I uh, you you've you're surrounded by an unbelievable offensive line, the best skill position talent in the league, all assembled in, in one group. Just distribute the football without doing a bunch of weird, crazy stuff. That's it. If you need to eat it every now and then, eat it. Just don't lose us the game by doing crazy stuff. Debo Samuel going out, obviously significant. We'll see what that looks like for the NFC Championship game. But for the Packers, and they've invested quite a bit of draft capital in the wide receiver position the last couple of drafts. Feels like they're missing a game changer. Yeah. Feels like they're missing a game changer. And Aaron Rodgers would probably hear that and go, yeah. <laughs> no kidding, you think? But Devontae Adams, you know. I I still think the craziest stat in the NFL is the fact that that win, it was the first time Kyle Shanahan had won a game as the head coach when trailing by five or more points entering the fourth quarter it moved them to one and 30. Wow. I just an insane stat with how good they've been. They've been really good. That's a quarterback stat. Like when you're behind late and you're one dimensional, it's on the quarterback, right? I mean, you've got to make throws. It's good. You're going to have to fit it in. You're going to have to make reads. Yeah. That's a, that's a quarterback stat right there. We'll definitely preview it on Wednesday's episode, but initial reaction, uh, reaction, initial reaction 
Kansas City at Baltimore, Detroit at San Francisco. Baltimore's a three and a half point favorite. San Francisco, a seven point favorite. Yeah. It's uh I it's gonna be Baltimore and Detroit. I think I Kansas think... City can go get it done. I really do. I yeah, just I, I, I can't bet against Mahomes, man. I'm just not doing it. I'm not oh, doing it. Give me Kansas City and Detroit. I know. It's, Maybe my it, mind will change by Wednesday. We'll see. It's hard to do. Um, you know, I I think there's a little bit, I think there's a little rust involved. Like Baltimore was a little rusty early in that first half. San Francisco looked a little rusty. Um, I mean, I think they'll play better next week. But, you know, when D- Detroit's got momentum, the way they're running the football, um, Goff is is solid, efficient defense. They're dangerous enough. Um, you know they got to be better on the back end. You know, but like, if there's a place to, like, that's where Purdy would would hurt you. But you're not not as worried about get hurt with it. I I don't know. I like Detroit. Like San Francisco is the more talented football team, but. Detroit, there's something about the momentum that they got. That's why I'm going there. And then in the AFC, I think Baltimore's the more well-rounded team. But, I mean, experience and, like, the statistics in the playoffs don't lie. Mahomes and Kansas City are nails. And somehow they always find a way to get it done. But I guess I'll go Baltimore right now. You sounded really convinced. (laughs) <laughs> birthday shout outs welcome to the world owen mccarthy happy sixth birthday to jude romines happy 15th birthday to caden helm happy 29th birthday to holly wood happy 37th to sid prater happy 61st birthday to rick prater Happy 66th birthday to Steve Papa Melton. Happy birthday to Channy Soft Serve Hawkins. What? There's got to be <laughs> there's got to be a story behind the nickname Soft Serve. And happy 33rd anniversary to Aaron and Lisa Kortschins. On that note, Episode 389 in the book. Did I did I say that right? Quartz gins. Quartz gins. I, I, I don't know where to go on that. I it's Quartz either gins. That. It's got to be right. Yeah. I got no no advice for you any any other way. I think I nailed it. Episode 389 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that'll drop on Wednesday morning. Just a reminder. You're Teddy on 94.7. Dang it. It's not 94.7 anymore. You got to make that on the ref. Dang it. <laughs> and you can hear me on Sirius Sex and Big 12 Radio Channel 375. Hope you all have a great start to your week. And it'll tell, until next time, we appreciate you all for listening. Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.